All right, so now we're joined by Mercedes Elizalde, who's running for uh, City Council District 5. So go ahead with a two minute introduction. Uh, so, yes, my name is Mercedes, and I'm running for Seattle City Council District 5 uh, because I'm a direct service provider. It's something that I know um, is just not really readily represented on the council, and having these districts makes it possible. Uh, when I say I'm a direct service provider, I'll give you a little bit of kind of my resume. Uh, I've done mostly youth work and mostly case management. So youth work in the sense I've run after school programs, including alternative ed and environmental education. And I've been a case manager in both employment support and housing. So employment support I've done for adults with developmental disabilities and for youth 16 to 21. And now most recently I've been working in housing case management until recently when I moved into my current role as a community outreach coordinator where I do most of our volunteer programs. Um, I am uh, originally from California and I grew up there with uh, my, my family. Uh, it's all very close together. You could walk from the house that my dad grew up in to the house that my mom grew up in in about 10 minutes. And my parents didn't move from that city until um, they bought their first house, uh, first and only house, uh, about 10 years ago. So I was already out of high school. Um, my family moved around a lot when I was a kid. Um, that's kind of, I think, where housing stability really hits home for me and why I've come to policy work. Um, it's really important to me to bring that perspective of somebody who uh, has been working with people for a long time, as well as has experienced a lot of things of the people that I'm working with. So that is what we're doing here today. Great. So now we have four prepared questions. You can turn the sheet over. Those are printed there so you can read along. Um, and I think we left off with, uh, these are two minute answers. And Evan, would you like to do number one? I'll see if you'll skip it. i skip myself. All right. Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, and subsidized housing, and rent control, amongst others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Um, so I, I've heard this term a lot, and I'm sure you all have the same, you know, we can't build our way out of uh, the affordability problem. I believe to a certain extent that we can. Um, I think it just matters what you mean by who is we in building our way out of it. Uh, working for a nonprofit housing provider gives me a lot of that um, really nitty gritty kind of information about what it means to build housing. So one of the first things that I think is really critical that we need to do is look at our incentive zoning laws and realize that they are targeting people who make more than two times the minimum wage. We are essentially subsidizing the development of housing with for-profit developers with tax money for people who are making $50,000 a year more, and that's one person. Um, and if you think about that, if you're a housing developer and your subsidized unit that you had to do all this incentive zoning stuff for is $1,200, why wouldn't your other units be 16 or 19? You know, those are the ground floor units. So I think, first of all, we need to kind of bring, we need to really define what we mean by affordable. For me, affordability means that if you work full-time in Seattle, you should be able to afford to live full-time in Seattle. <laughs> and so looking at the incentive zoning things that we put together and making sure that they're targeting that population, that minimum wage population. Um, so that's going to include things like linkage fees and impact fees. It's going to include things like incentive zoning with this, with a new definition of what it means to participate in that. I don't think that it should be an option for developers to um, provide affordable housing or not. I think it, it should be inclusive. It should be part of uh, the set of values we have as a city, that we want people to build for the people who live here. Um, and I see bringing those different types of approaches together will really help to, again, to bring down that definition of affordability to um, our minimum wage workers were then targeting about 41% of the renters fall in that um, minimum wage um, income area. So then we're building housing for both one of the largest portions of renters as well as um, people who really need that bag the most. So um, in general, what I what my approach tends to be is to redefine affordability, make sure that we all have an agreement on what it means. Thank you, Jan. <coughs> 
Last year, voters approved a levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of this program, and what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? Um, so, one of the core parts of my campaign has been around equitable access to social services, and preschool is now, you know, one of those that is something that the government is now working to help to provide. One of my biggest concerns around um, the preschool program is that there is not a provider uh, in the North End that is large enough to apply for this program. You have to be able to hold two classrooms of 16 or more um, children. The providers that we have in the area most only run one classroom and only have the capacity to run one classroom. And in my conversations with the city, um, the Office of Education, when I've asked this question, they've said, well, figure it out when we get there, you know, because we're starting in the south end, you know, we're starting in southeast, southwest, we're not even starting there, so we'll figure it out when we get there. Or that they'll say that they've done some information sessions in the area and just nobody has approached them ready to do it. Now, that answer is an answer we can do something about. If you look at other neighborhoods where there's been some sort of barrier to providing a program, we've done a needs assessment, we've identified what the barriers are, and We've tried to mitigate them in order to have the program that we need there. Uh, we have essentially a couple of years before this program is going to make it into the North End, so we should be doing that work now. So <coughs> that there is a provider in the area that is stable and ready and has the capacity to take on the program. Um, as far as the continual funding of it, you know, I think we rely on levies a lot in this city, probably too much. I think we really need to be looking at different ways that we can be using taxes. We can't continue to have um, a levy for housing and a levy for transportation and a levy for preschool uh, and really dicing up people's property taxes and all these little and all these little bits. Um, I have kind of the sense that if there was a really clear amount of money that everyone was paying into a pot and then it was divided later, it would be a lot less stressful as a taxpayer to participate in that. So I would think that a restructuring a little bit of the kind of the whole tax system that we have. Um, I know having a fully fledged income tax just in the city is like a very complicated part of that, but I think we can relook at the way that we're doing property taxes for the city programs, um, make it a little bit easier for homeowners and for um, everyone who's paying into taxes to understand where that money is going without it being divided up on their end, but instead divided up on the city end. So general fund money. Do the wrap up. Let's go to number three. Uh, Bertha is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront, transit, and an unsafe viaduct? Um, so, you know, I feel like I've referred this question a lot. You know, um, part of it is that we should have, part of it is that um, when we decided to go ahead with this plan, I think there should have been a little bit more transparency around like plan E's, like what happens if, or that it's likely that these things will happen. As working for a housing developer, I do know that projects run over cost. Uh, it's just something that tends to happen. You're always looking for that one that's going to run under, but you know, it happens. And I think that we should be providing everybody with some real clear insight into so this is what's happening, and these are the contingency plans. And obviously we're not hearing that, which is why everyone is like, so we're we just going to stop. Are we done with this? What's happening? You know? And that's one of the really critical things that government is really responsible for, is around that transparency, is around making people feel like their tax dollars are being spent well. And when we look at what's happening with the waterfront, and we're looking at different types of revenue that are trying to be put into restructuring the space so it's more tourist friendly, so it, it is more pedestrian friendly, and I think we can continue to move that way while at the same time um, recognizing that there is this information segregation that's happening. We don't even know if there is a backup plan or if there is a break point when the city has spent too much. Those things may exist that may have been a plan set up for this project, but none of us would know that, and I think that that's a little bit unfair. And so when it comes to having these types of really big projects that spend a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer money in particular, that we need to have a lot of transparency around what is the break point. At what point is 
do we need to stop and reevaluate where, where we are? Because that might be different for different people, but if we all understand where that space is, I think we have a little bit more tolerance for um, ambiguity, I guess. We have a little bit more tolerance for this, this stress that's happening. And I think as a city council member, I, don't, I wouldn't have all the answers for all of these things, but what would be really important is to be incredibly transparent and to bring as many people into the conversation as possible. Maria, would you read number four? Sure. Seattle is the fastest growing clean city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth? And what policy changes are necessary to accommodate this growth? Um, I don't really know if we can discourage the growth. I'm not sure <laughs> if that's if that's I mean, I'm sure we can make it inhospitable and not awesome, but that's not something that would hurt all of us. Um, just the growth. So I, I don't necessarily know if that's uh, really an option. <laughs> but as far as how we encourage it, how we and how we make it something that um, doesn't change the character of our neighborhoods in a way that we don't want, something that doesn't push out our neighbors, um, something that doesn't sacrifice the, the good things of the city for the sake of growth, are um, things around uh, what I've been talking about around responsible development. And that's when we look at not just permitting one thing or the other, but making sure that we're building whole communities. So one of those examples is, where, uh, I think Ballard is a really great example where you saw a lot of permitting of buildings and a lot of cuts in transportation. And buildings at the same time being built without <coughs> parking, assuming that there was going to be transportation, even though we were at the same time didn't have the funds to keep up. Um, and that's not necessary. You know, that's not, that's not a necessary thing that has to happen. Uh, as a housing developer, I also know that we can get a permit without um, without having a piece of land totally locked down. We can have a permit for an area to start developing funding and getting partners. That's called the state fund permit for a nonprofit developer. And um, so we know we're building somewhere in this area. We have it locked down the exact plot of land we're building on, but we know it, the city knows it, so there should be a co-current plan for the transportation that's going to happen in that area, for the jobs that are going to be grown in that area, and specifically around bikes and pedestrian um, friendly spaces for that area. It, and the comprehensive plans the city has developed, these 20-year plans, help us to understand where those targeted areas of growth are. And if the last 20-year plan is any indication, we're going to be fairly right on with the number of people we expect to have. So we can have those co-current plans. Great. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. We'll start with Clayton. Um, <clears throat> with respect to council problems, uh, I wonder to what extent you see uh, reorganization of the Seattle Housing Authority uh, or maybe uh, to what extent do you see SHA as a part of uh, the problem solution issue? What we can do to achieve a <coughs> see how it's going to Did you wait, so I'll check. Um, so how do I see the Seattle Housing Authority playing a role with like other nonprofit developers or um, just in general? Do you <coughs>
yes. Given the controversy at Terminal 5 at the Port of Seattle, how would you balance uh, the city's urgent need for living wage jobs with the city's deep and systemic interest in environmental sustainability? Um, so, I think when we look at um, how we how we continue to invest in these different areas, we can move away from uh, investing in things that we don't support in order to invest in things that we do support and create jobs there. And the Bullet Center is a really great example of where you where you saw amazing construction and amazing investment happen that was incredibly real. You know that was like national news amazing. And we can continue to invest in those types of things in order to create those types of jobs. And um, I don't think we need to sacrifice our values in order to do that, but I do think that it's important to remember that we're not the only players in that game. Um, this is the same kind of conversation that happens around the coal trains. We need to recognize that we're not actually using that coal, we're exporting that coal. And how do we have, um, how do we have appropriate um, investments in places and have appropriate partners while at the same time investing in the things that we have value in. So I think we can definitely look at um, green jobs where we're building things here. <laughs> sorry. I had 10 seconds for a long time, so I wasn't Yeah, so I just kind of ask questions and do time and all this is too much. So Renee, Renee and Elizabeth. So I think it's important um, when we talk about the economy, a city's economy, build a localized economy versus one that's totally connected to the national economy or the international economy. And so one of the ways to do that is to really support local businesses and their supply chains. How can we go about doing that? Um, so one of the things I've actually been talking about now with the move forward transportation is around um, routes to necessities. So we have this language that we use around routes, safe routes to school. Um, and if we can use that same language around safe routes and necessities, I think we'll see a little bit more of that. <coughs> and by necessities, well, it's a good example of in my neighborhood there is a grocery store, and around that grocery store there um, there is a little cat clinic, and there is a uh, dry cleaners, and there is a nail salon, uh, and there's a little coffee shop. There's a bunch of little things all plus from this area. 15th Avenue is the only street in that area that has a sidewalk. So anyone else coming from any other direction is walking in the street, or they're going to drive someplace else. <coughs> the more that those are the options, the more you're going to see some of those businesses struggling. And so if we really want to make those investments in these urban village models, I think we need to look at how we're creating safe routes to get to those places, making it incredibly accessible and easy to get there. Um, we'll also keeping in mind that when we're building out those spaces that we're uh, building for rents that um, can accommodate a business. I think that's why we've seen a lot of these ground floor uh, vacancies for far too long. So keeping in mind those two. Can you speak to some of the, what you would bring up as ideas for reducing sex trafficking along Aurora in, or through the whole city of Seattle in particular? the minors and the workers. Absolutely. So um, I really uh, I really respect um, Pete Holmes' movement to not arrest and prosecute um, people who are picked up for uh, being prostituted or being trafficked. I think that's a huge step in that. And the next step after that is providing um, services and connections to services to um, get out of the life. And one of the things that we already have up in infrastructure for and that we can build out is the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, COLEED. That has been a really great tool for uh, connecting with people through law enforcement to get them connected with services. And then again, looking at equitable access to services, making sure that they have somewhere to go, particularly in, the, in District 5 in the North End, that their only service is not bus tickets downtown, but that there are places um, close to where they're staying, where they feel their networks are, or where they feel safe to make sure people are getting the professional services. We have time for one short question. So, with redistricting, <clears throat> with the districting, we have the opportunity to be focused in our neighborhood efforts, yet the policies that have to be developed have to work universally across the city. How are you going to be able to do both those things, advocate for the North End and create consistent policies across the city? 
So I think that's going to all come into perspective. I think you're going to have some people who are going to come up, come in here and say that their first priority is going to be district, whatever it is, in my case, district five, and then looking at how that works into the city model. But I'm going to be very clear that my um, my number one priority is the city of Seattle. And what the districts allow for us to do is to have always somebody kind of chirping for, for their neighborhood, saying, well, let's not forget about the disparate impact on this neighborhood, let's not forget about the benefits also coming to that neighborhood, and always keeping that part of the conversation. So instead of thinking of it as, I'm going to be all about District 5 and then figure out how that works for the rest of the city, I'm going to be all about the city and make sure that District 5 never gets forgotten. And that is how I would approach keeping that together. Great, so about out of time. I want to take just 30 seconds to wrap up the closing comment. <laughs> Um, so, one of the reasons that I've been coming around and, and meeting with all of you and then now here requesting your endorsement is really because I believe that being a direct service provider is something that is critically missing on the city council. Most people who run for city council races um, are very far into their careers, if not retired, uh, or they've been in politics since their first LA job in undergrad. And this is the very first time, I think, that somebody like me who works every day with people most affected by the policy decisions that we make to have a seat at the table to represent them and to keep, uh, keep to the forefront building policy with implementation in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you.